There are two major characters in this story, and a minor one, so let me introduce them. The first was born in Canada in 1888 and grew up in Ontario before moving to Boston, Massachusetts, aged 17. When she was older, Mina Crandon became perhaps the most controversial medium of all time. The other major character was the son of a rabbi, Eric Weiss. He was born in 1874 in Budapest, and as a child he moved with his family to Milwaukee. You'll know him by that familiar name, Harry Houdini, the sensational escape artist. Once tied up by others, he could get out of any knots, straight jackets, handcuffs and even underwater in sealed boxes. Later in his career, Houdini became a professional debunker of spiritual mediums. The minor character in this movie is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, an English physician, the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and a man committed to spiritualism. But we start with Mina Crandon, who was investigated in the 1920s as much as any medium ever. Most reports say that she was a fraud. Known for her wit and musical ability, she was described as too attractive for her own good. After an unsuccessful first marriage, she soon had a new husband, almost 20 years her senior. Dr. Crandon was formerly a surgeon in the Navy, seen here. And later he was a surgeon and instructor at Harvard Medical School. As his third wife, Mina moved into his home at 10 Lime Street, shown here, in the fashionable Beacon Hill area of Boston. In 1923, Dr. Leroy Crandon, tall, slender, scholarly, sophisticated, and a member of the city's high society, encouraged his wife and their friends to explore contacting the dead through table tipping, inspired to do so by his Harvard colleague, Dr. Mark Richardson, who had lost two sons to polio, and also through reading the books of the psychical researcher Dr. William Crawford, investigating the Golliger Circle in Ireland. It soon became clear that Mina was the group's medium, and thenceforward they held seances by invitation only. Mostly these took place in the dark, on the fourth floor of 10 Lime Street. Mina had a spirit control on the other side, claiming to be her older brother. When alive, Walter Stinson was five years her senior, and he died in a train accident being crushed in 1911, aged 28. He was the power behind most of her manifestations. Originally, he responded to taps on the table. Shortly afterwards, Walter spoke through Mina's voice under trance and later he appeared to speak independently of her in the seance room. This was tested in various ways, as I'll describe later. And one thing to know about Walter was his lively use of language, often vulgar, sometimes profane and argumentative, and not what you might expect from a supposed spirit. One commentator described him as kind of a smart-ass. But why did Mina create such a stir? Well, according to Dr. Crandon, she could manifest rapping noises that answered questions through a code and could produce psychic breezes and glowing psychic lights that moved in the dark. There were scents of different odours, musical noises, even though no instruments were present, and she's also reported producing automatic writing in nine languages under trance, even though she was not a linguist, and this included ancient Chinese and Japanese. She could move objects, and at one seance a table was reported chasing a sitter out of the seance room into a bedroom and then down the stairs, with the remaining sitters following after them. She could also apport items into the seance room and produce ectoplasm and materialisations, as seen here. Also, the gramophone, a Victrola, similar to this one, that played at 78 RPM records, turns itself off and on spontaneously, or by order of the sitters. In 1929, Dr Crandon gave an address in London, describing Marjorie's abilities. In one case, she was seated in an all-glass cabinet, 
seven feet by six feet by three feet. Her ankles were lashed to eye bolts in the floor by picture wire with sealed ends. Her hands came through side portholes and they were lashed. A leather band was kept round her neck and fastened by stout cord to the back of the cabinet so she could hardly move or cheat. Two professors were locked in the room with Marjorie in the cabinet. A luminous paper ring was passed into the cabinet. It was seized by a visible hand and carried above the medium's head, three feet behind her chair, and all over the cabinet like a firefly. Other objects were also lifted, and at the end of the experiment the lashings were intact. An account was published in the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research. Another time, Walter was discussing electrons with a physics professor, and he said, Comstock, to show these electrons, why don't you bring down here some night your spintheroscope? This is an instrument that was unknown to Marjorie and the sitters, and it demonstrated Walter's independence of the medium. Then there was the matter of cross-correspondences. A sceptical stranger brought to a seance an envelope containing 40 to 50 leaves of a one-day calendar and some torn magazine pages. A number and a magazine page were picked at random and held up for Walter to perceive in the blackness of the seance room. To complete the sitting, Marjorie went downstairs to a brightly lit room, no trance, wrote a number, drew a picture and wrote words. The number and torn magazine page selected upstairs were then shown to correspond nearly 100% with what Marjorie had created. The sceptic then rang two other mediums, one in New York and one in Cambridge, who had also produced nearly 100% what Marjorie had already drawn. As a variant to this, Walter sometimes said that the first number chosen shall be multiplied by the second number selected, and the product will be found by the two distant mediums, each providing one number. Thus the Lime Street numbers might be 12 times 2, and the medium's numbers will be 2 and 4. Thus 12 times 2 equals 24. It didn't take long for Mina to attract wide attention, and she became a subject of four consecutive investigations. Throughout all of these, she remained remarkably cooperative, good-humoured and patient with those who were testing her. The first formal test was led by Dr William MacDougall, who was Professor of Psychology at Harvard University and one-time President of both the British and the American Societies for Psychical Research. For him, mind and brain function were not the same, but nonetheless he was a sceptic, virtually impossible to convince. After five months of observation and experiments, his committee gave no opinion on Mina's trance utterances and decided that the majority of her physical effects were fraudulent. By contrast, Dr. Crandon saw his wife as, and I quote, a remarkable psychic instrument, and in December 1923, he took her to Europe on a whistle-stop tour to show her off to experts. In Paris, she impressed Dr. Gustav Gelli and Charles Richet. After a sitting in his own home, Conan Doyle declared her a very powerful medium, with gifts beyond all question. It's not quite clear whether it was Conan Doyle or this man, Malcolm Bird, associate editor of the Scientific American magazine, who persuaded Mrs. Crandon to participate in his magazine's competition, which had begun in 1922. It offered a $2,500 prize to the first medium to demonstrate a verifiable, visible psychic manifestation. Conan Doyle provided the inspiration for this competition, following the public's enthusiastic response to his US speaking tour on spiritualism. And the journal's owner, Mr. Munn, thought this prize might tease out the facts of spiritualism. Even Walter relished the challenge of this competition. Malcolm Bird became secretary to the investigators and gave Mina the pseudonym Marjorie to protect her identity, and this lasted for the rest of her life. 
Before she took part, four other mediums had already been rejected by this committee. George Valentine, renowned for his direct voice communications, was the first. Also, Mrs. R. Thompson, the English medium who convinced Frederick Myers, the author of this famous book, that our consciousness survives death. In fact, Myers and his friends witnessed over 200 sittings with her, whereas the Scientific American Committee remained unimpressed. The two other entrants were Josie K. Stewart and Nino Pecoraro. All were rejected. The committee began sitting with Marjorie in January 1924. It was made up of Dr. Comstock, the Harvard University physicist who actually invented Technicolor. He was more proactive in this investigation than any of the others. Also, Harrywood Carrington, a well-known British-born American psychical researcher, Dr. William MacDougall, already mentioned in the previous investigation, Dr. Walter Franklin Prince, a sceptic and magician and later the founder of the Boston Society for Psychical Research, and finally, of course, the magician Harry Houdini. Conan Doyle was outraged at the inclusion of Houdini, regarding it as what he called a capital error to give an enemy of spiritualism a place on such a body. This commission is, in my opinion, a farce, he wrote, and the investigations were not well coordinated. Comstock attended 56 seances, Bird and Carrington attended 51 each, MacDougall attended 22, Prince participated just 10 times, and Houdini, who was usually touring with his show, was involved only five times. After a few months, Malcolm Bird began reporting positively on Marjorie in editions of the Scientific American, without such a consensus existing on the committee itself. Both Bird and Carrington were sympathetic to awarding her the prize. As a result of more than 40 sittings with Marjorie, Carrington declared, I have arrived at the definite conclusion that genuine supernormal phenomena frequently occur. Many of the manifestations might have been produced fraudulently. However, a number of instances remain when phenomena were produced and observed under practically perfect control. Although the committee's opinions on Marjorie varied, the New York Times nonetheless reported, Marjorie passes all psychic tests. Scientists find no trickery in scores of seances with Boston Medium. Such headlines put her firmly at the centre of national attention, and Houdini was not pleased. So he turned up in Boston to make his own contribution, telling the Scientific American he would forfeit $1,000 of his own money if he failed to expose Marjorie as a fraud. This was not at all open-minded, or an impartial approach, and thus Houdini's crusade against her began. He insisted there should be more control during seances than having sitters hold Marjorie's hands and feet and those of her husband. So Houdini delivered to Boston a special cabinet, a lockable crate for Marjorie to sit in with openings only for her head and arms, seen here. When she was inside this, it should severely limit any opportunities for deception, but Marjorie cooperated all the same. There's much more to say about this cabinet, and I'll do so shortly. But the upshot of Houdini's interventions was that the prize committee, while not stating that Marjorie was definitely a fraud, nonetheless concluded on the 12th of February 1925 that the evidence was not strong enough to justify giving her the prize. Conan Doyle's response was indignation. It's difficult to say which was the more annoying, he declared. Houdini, the conjurer, with his preposterous and ignorant theories of fraud, or such scientific sitters as Professor MacDougall, who after 50 sittings and signing as many papers at the end of each sitting to endorse the wonders recorded, was still unable to give any definite judgment and contented himself with vague innuendos. So now I turn your attention to Michael Prescott's well-known internet blog site with its excellent article entitled The Two Faces of Marjorie. It does the job of contrasting and comparing two books with opposing views on Marjorie's authenticity. 
Science and Parascience by Brian Inglis was published in 1984 and is supportive of her mediumship, while Mediums, Mystics and the Occult by Milbourne Christopher, published in 1975, is not. This article illustrates in detail how difficult it is at, at this distance of time to come to a watertight view on the Marjorie case based on the details of the Scientific American investigation. It shows how commentators habitually choose evidence supporting their prior view on the existence or otherwise of a spiritual dimension. What this article does not do, however, is mention the later matter-through-matter experiments of 1934, using rings of different woods. This provides the evidence that clinches the issue for me, so I'll come to it later. There are still two more investigations to mention. One in 1925 was conducted by young Harvard postgraduates with little psychical experience. Their final report, seen here, remained unpublished, but I've seen a copy of Dr. Richardson's, and it summarises supernormal seance evidence, which was signed off as accurate, while their conclusion denied these favourable findings. And so to the final investigation. Clearly, Marjorie had made a sufficiently favourable impact during her European visit to justify the arrival in Boston of a psychical researcher from the English SPR to investigate her further. In this report, Dr Eric Dingwall, the Society's research officer and a sceptic, said of Marjorie's mediumship, quote, I did not succeed in achieving my primary purpose of coming to a definite conclusion as to the genuineness or otherwise of the phenomena. During the course of 29 sittings, the evidence seemed to me at one time for, and at another time against, their supernormal nature, but never to incline decisively either way. And thus the unsatisfactory and inconclusive British investigation ended. So can we now get on and dismiss Marjorie as just another dud spiritual medium, as others have done? In my view, the answer is an emphatic no. Let's take a look at the evidence for her being genuine. Firstly, the young Harvard investigators witnessed psychic breezes during the seances, and the Scientific American Committee also noted these breezes, which are actually characteristic of seances with other mediums. The young Harvard group also experimented with a luminous paper donut on the seance table, and they were impressed by seeing in the light of it the development of materialised ectoplasmic terminals, or pseudopods. In the Scientific American investigations, paraffin wax hands were made from these terminals, similar but inferior to the famous Klusky hand moulds in Paris. Then there was the question of whether the voice of spirit control Walter was produced by Marjorie herself, or maybe by her husband. Several tests showed that Walter's talking was independent of the medium, and this surely provides evidence favourable to the spirit hypothesis. In one test, doctors MacDougall and Comstock each clasped their hands over the mouths of Marjorie and her husband, in another, Marjorie took a quantity of coloured water into her mouth so she could not speak while Walter continued to do so. On spitting out this water for measurement, it contained the same quantity as went in. They also filled the sitter's mouth with marbles and Marjorie's mouth with an inflatable balloon. In this book, Marjorie the Medium, Malcolm Bird claims that Walter and the Medium sometimes spoke over each other. And finally, there was a thoughtfully designed apparatus made by Dr. Richardson, seen here. It required Marjorie and every sitter at a seance to hold in their mouths a mouthpiece attached to two glass tubes. The sitters would blow into the tubes to raise the liquid level in one tube and depress the level in the other. They then put their tongues and lips over the mouthpiece to keep the pressure. If for even one moment they relaxed, the fall of pressure showed up even in the dark since each glass tube had a floating luminous marker in it. In this way it was established beyond doubt that Walter's voice was a direct voice phenomenon independent of the medium. 
And these photographs show Marjorie in a trance, exuding ectoplasm that Walter claimed was the voice box being formed through which he would speak. Another proof of Walter's independent existence was his speaking into a microphone housed inside a sealed, soundproof box, with his voice being amplified over loudspeakers in the seance room. There was other evidence involving ectoplasm production too, and the control by Walter of a pair of scientific scales, where one dish on the scales was weighted down, yet the scales were made to seesaw or stay level with no hands near. In 1927, once the four investigations were concluded, the Crandons went to Canada to visit the country's foremost psychical researcher, Dr T.G. Hamilton, seen here. After numerous seances and tests, he declared Marjorie's mediumship genuine. But for me, Marjorie proved herself the real deal in the experiments of June and July 1932, with two wooden rings, seen here. These experiments demonstrated the passage of matter through matter, as reported by William Button in the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research. It was Britain's Sir Oliver Lodge who suggested that the paranormal linking of two rings made of different woods would provide irrefutable evidence of psychic force. And it was at a Marjorie seance that these rings, provided by him, were interlocked. In his 1973 book entitled Marjorie, Thomas Tietze says the famous Irish poet W.B. Yeats was present at the seance when this feat was first achieved and it was repeated several times. One set of rings was sent to Sir Oliver Lodge in England as a thank you, but it arrived broken, possibly damaged in the post. Another set was shown to the British spiritualist and famous journalist Hannan Swaffer when he visited the Crandons in 1934. They were photographed, as seen here, put in a sealed, glass-covered box, and they were presented to the American Society for Psychical Research for safekeeping. On a return visit, however, when Swaffer asked to see the rings again, one of them was broken. Some speculated that mankind is not supposed to possess undisputable psychic proof. Incidentally, in September of that year, Button also reported in the Journal of the ASPR on Marjorie seances at which a variety of objects were removed from sealed boxes and also introduced into such boxes. These seances were held to confirm the results of similar tests undertaken in Germany by Professor Zollner. Now, I must acknowledge that Marjorie's mediumship had its detractors. What follows is based on anecdote, speculation and hearsay, and it's short on evidence. Dr. Crandon himself was described as arrogant, unpleasant and antisocial, with a suggestion that they had a rocky marriage so that fraudulent seances represented Marjorie's effort to please her husband in order to hold the marriage together. Another allegation was that Dr. Crandon was his wife's accomplice in fraud and that he even surgically enlarged her vagina to enable her to hide items to be produced once a seance had begun. There were hints involving bizarre sex that she gave seances in the nude to arouse her sitters and would throw herself onto the laps of the men while also sprinkling luminous powder on her breasts. Also, it was alleged that Dr Crandon was fully aware of her sexual encounters with investigators upstairs while he was in the house downstairs. Did she have affairs with Bird and Carrington, who both stayed as guests at Lime Street for weeks at a time? Was even Houdini thus involved? Innuendo says yes. It was also alleged that Harrywood Carrington borrowed from Dr Crandon sums of money he could not repay, being thus influenced to support Marjorie's manifestations. And most outrageous of all was a story that Crandon and his wife sought boys in England for adoption who then disappeared in mysterious circumstances. Though the evidence may be scant for any of this, it would not be the first time, of course, that dirty tricks were employed by sceptics to undermine the authenticity of a medium or investigator. Take the case of Sir William Crookes in London. 
Since he confirmed as real the materialization of the spirit Katie King through the mediumship of Florence Cook, he was accused of a possible extramarital affair with Florence that may have undermined his judgment of her mediumship. Ultimately, Marjorie's fame and reputation declined over one specific controversy in the 1930s. Spirit thumbprints in dental wax were made during seances that were claimed to be those of the materialised Walter. This photograph shows a large number of them, and some were mysterious mirror images of each other. Yet many of these prints were discovered to belong to her dentist, who provided the wax for these experiments. On the other hand, some prints were said to be real, a match for the fingerprints on Walter's razor, while others matched his army records. However, the claim of fraud stuck in this case, and it was this particular controversy that finished off Marjorie's public standing for good. And now, here is an important development. Meet this man, Stuart Alexander, a well-known British physical medium, now partially retired. His book of memoirs, An Extraordinary Journey, has two chapters on Marjorie. He was convinced her mediumship was genuine, and that in her time, she was much abused by her detractors. And guess what? Years later, his spirit control was Walter himself, Marjorie's brother. In the intervening years, he'd mellowed and spoke more politely. But then comes the bombshell in Alexander's last chapter. Asked in 1994 about the episode of the fraudulent fingerprints, Walter admits that although the first fingerprints produced were genuine, later, to compensate for when the psychic power was too low, Dr. Crandon had a dye made of the living dentist's fingerprints on the assumption that these would never be identified. He cheated. And furthermore, Walter knew that he cheated and did not object about it or stop it, as he should have done. This certainly gives ammunition to those alleging Marjorie is fraudulent, even if not completely so. As a result, Crandon smirched his wife's reputation through his stupidity, and so did Walter. Even so, some aspects of the fingerprint fiasco were definitely genuine. Dr Robin Tilliard, FRS, an entomologist from Australia, became convinced of survival after death following his sitting, held alone with Marjorie, on the 10th of August, 1928. A week later, the journal Nature published his findings. He chose a venue away from Lime Street. His protocol was eye-wateringly severe, with Marjorie's body searched by a nurse, and she wore clothes provided by him, and she was bound to her chair at her arms and ankles with strong sticky tape, marked with a blue pen, continuing onto her arms to show if she'd released herself from her bonds. Yet even in a locked room, and with a glimmer of light available through the blinds, and with Walter talking in a loud, clear voice, genuine fingerprints were obtained. And afterwards, Marjorie had difficulty getting released from her tapes as the hot weather had stuck the glue firmly to her arms. Tilliard described it as the sitting of a lifetime, where cheating had been completely eliminated. Following the fingerprint scandal, Walter found a new way to impress at Marjorie Seances, being able to name articles hidden inside a plaster of Paris cake. But this made little difference to Marjorie's reputation. From here, things only got worse. In 1939, Dr Crandon fell downstairs from the seance room, and he died weeks later. In less than two years, Marjorie also died on the 1st of November, 1941, aged only 53. By this time, she was reported to be an alcoholic, and just as her life was about to ebb, Nandor Fodor, an author of well-known books on psychical matters, such as his Encyclopedia of Psychic Science, came to her bedside, asking her to come clean. Was she, or was she not a fraud? Her reply was ambiguous. Why don't you guess, she laughed. You'll all be guessing for the rest of your lives. And she was right. Years later, we are still talking about it. 
She also refused ever to return to Earth to speak through a medium or act as a guide or helper, given the treatment that she'd received during her own mediumship. Let me turn now to the other major character in this story, Harry Houdini. He was a magician famous for his escape acts, whose career began actually as a trapeze artist. He was a remarkable man, with a particularly close relationship with Cecilia, whom he referred to as his sainted mother, seen here with him. Even after his marriage to Beatrice, the partner in his stage shows, he still saw both as being of equal importance in his life. And in 1913, while Houdini was touring in Denmark, Cecilia's death changed nothing. He declared it a shock, from which I do not think recovery is possible, he said. And he added, if God in his greatness ever sent an angel on earth in human form, it was my mother. And he went on to declare, I believe in a hereafter, and no greater blessing could be bestowed upon me than the opportunity once again to speak to my sainted mother who awaits me with open arms to press me to her heart in welcome, just as she did when I entered this mundane sphere. You might even wonder if this obsessive passion for his mother was entirely healthy, but with his determination to contact her after death, he attended many seances, hoping for evidence, before concluding that actually all mediums were unscrupulous fakes. Henceforward, he devoted himself to exposing them, spending forty to fifty thousand dollars a year in the process. Sometimes he attended seances in disguise, and then he'd stand up during the seance and declare, I am Houdini, and you are a fraud. And this provided publicity for a man, the popularity of whose shows was already in decline. In fact, one claim suggests that Houdini was not actually trying to contact the spirit of his mother, as the myth goes, but trying instead to resurrect his career. Now, it would seem an unlikely development for Houdini the sceptic to become friends with Conan Doyle, the spiritualist, but it happened in England in 1920, when Houdini took his act there. Afterwards, when Houdini was back in the States, they wrote to each other often. But this friendship came to a sticky end in 1922 in Atlantic City, New Jersey, when Conan Doyle and his wife Jean were on a United States visit. Jean, a medium, offered Houdini contact with his mother through automatic writing, and she wrote a message purporting to come from her. Initially, Houdini appeared moved by this, but later he criticised the message on three grounds. Firstly, it had a cross at the top, which his mother, a Jew, would never have drawn. Secondly, the message was in English, which his mother did not speak. And thirdly, since the message was delivered on his mother's birthday, Houdini did not believe she could have ignored that important fact in her message. So this friendship fell apart and later became antagonistic. With regard to Houdini's determination to debunk Marjorie, this involved his facing an unexpected adversary in Walter, Marjorie's spirit control. Walter jeered at Houdini by declaring, still trying to get publicity by haunting seance rooms, eh? During one seance, Houdini accused Marjorie of using her foot to depress the lid on a bell box to make it ring. Here's the bell box. This was cheating using normal pressure, he said, when it should only have rung in response to psychic power. Later, using Houdini's fraud-preventing cabinet, during the first seance with Marjorie inside it, the top of the cabinet was broken open. By who knows what force? Could it be Walter, who had previously wrecked numerous seance cabinets? Possibly so, since Marjorie's head was sticking out the top of the cabinet and her hands through either side and were held. She could not have done it herself. Houdini was blamed for the flimsy construction. Also, with Marjorie in this cabinet at another seance, the bell box would not ring at all. Despite the seance room being dark, however, Walter still detected the reason for this. He claimed it had been tampered with 
and on inspection this proved to be true. A rubber eraser had been inserted into the mechanism to stop it functioning. Houdini was blamed, but he denied it. Once it was ringing again under spirit influence, Walter called out, How do you like that, Houdini? At another cabinet seance, the issue of fraud raised its head again. A collapsible carpenter's ruler was found on the floor inside the cabinet that could theoretically have been used to manipulate apparatus outside the cabinet if Marjorie had held it in her mouth. Again, it was Walter who announced it was there. Houdini, you goddamn bastard, get the hell out of here and never come back, he's alleged to have uttered. Again, Houdini denied involvement, claiming the ruler had been planted there to impugn him. Malcolm Bird's book, reviewing hundreds of seances from the signed records, says that when the committee wanted to inspect the cabinet prior to this seance, Houdini refused permission, and yet he passed his own hand in through the handholds just before the seance began, for reasons unknown. When Mr and Mrs Crandon offered to hold the seance in red light, making everything visible, Houdini again absolutely refused to sit in anything but total darkness, without giving any reason. When, prior to the seance, the female stenographer who had searched Marjorie for incriminating evidence was criticised for the way that she'd done this, the Crandons offered a physician to anatomically search Marjorie again. But Houdini rejected this offer too. Maybe he feared it would highlight her innocence. But Houdini fought back by denouncing Malcolm Bird as Marjorie's accomplice, which forced Bird to resign his role as committee secretary. And there the matter rested for almost 35 years until 1959, when this biography of Houdini was published by William Lindsay Gresham. An Amazon reviewer said of it, The biographer is fair and just in pointing out Houdini's flaws and virtues. He's not out to sling mud. But there is mud in this book. In it, Jim Collins, who was Houdini's personal assistant in the Marjorie days, admits in relation to the ruler in the cabinet, quote, I chucked it in the box myself. The boss told me to do it. He wanted to fix her good. Regardless of the committee, Houdini was determined to declare Marjorie a fraud and embarrass her in his stage act. First, he published a booklet entitled Houdini Exposes the Tricks Used by the Boston Medium Marjorie. This photograph I found on the excellent website Wild About Harry, and it shows Marjorie's own copy of this booklet. Its contents seem pretty reasonable to me, even if his subsequent behaviour was not. He regained possession of the Marjorie cabinet from Boston, and he took it on tour. He challenged Marjorie to appear on stage with him at a magnificent venue in Boston, the Symphony Hall seen here. And he offered a challenge backed by $10,000 in bonds for Marjorie to create physical manifestations that he could not emulate with trickery. If she did not show up, Houdini would spend the time humorously exposing her methods to the audience, which he then did, much to their delight. Marjorie became as ridiculed as she was famous. The Crandons did not turn up on either night of the show, preferring to hold their own meeting in another hall. There was precious little defence of Marjorie at this time, but Professor MacDougall did accuse Houdini of being both prejudiced and unfair. There's one footnote worth mentioning here. In the animosity surrounding Houdini's membership of the committee, Walter is said to have declared, Houdini, you goddamn son of a bitch, I put a curse on you that will follow you every day for the rest of your short life. And he predicted Houdini would be dead within a year. In fact, it took a few months longer than that. Harry Houdini died in pain in Detroit on Halloween, the 31st of October, 1926, of peritonitis after a burst appendix. He's thought to have suffered this after taking a hard punch to the abdomen that he'd agreed to take from a backstage visitor, but for which he was not properly prepared. He'd always boasted his strength in this regard, 
inviting such punctures. But in this case, despite his pain, he refused for days to go to hospital. So his death was arguably his own fault. Some newspapers and websites have even wondered if he was murdered by spiritualists. In this Houdini biography, the authors Kalush and Sloman quote a November 1924 letter in which Conan Doyle remarks that Houdini would, quote, get his just desserts very exactly meted out. I think there's a general payday coming soon. But Houdini did not die for another two years. Being a world-famous phenomenon, 2,000 people attended his funeral, and this is the grandiose memorial where he's buried. We can only hope that he finally met Cecilia. Lying in his coffin, his head lay on 200 of her letters. It's ironic, considering Houdini's campaign against spiritualism, that both he and his wife planned to communicate with each other from beyond the grave after death, if at all possible. When his mother, Cecilia, died in 1913, her last word on this earth was forgive, and Houdini had wanted for all his life to hear a medium give this word as proof of her survival, but none came. Houdini also arranged with his wife, Bess, that his own message to her from the other side would be one that only she would understand. While Bess received many messages through mediums, none were correct which is why, after a year, she offered $10,000 to any medium who provided what she was seeking. And then, on the 8th of February, 1928, Arthur Ford, a pastor of the First Spiritualist Church in New York City, claimed that he'd gone into trance with a small group, and that Cecilia Weiss had come through, saying, All his later life, my Harry sought to hear from me a word I spoke before I died. Forgive, that was the word. His wife Bess knew it, no one else. Contact her to see if what I say is true. When Bess received this message, it was the first time that any message seemed to be correct, and she was impressed. Had Houdini heard that word, she declared, it would have changed, I think, the whole course of his life, but it came too late. You can find Arthur Ford's account of his contact with Bess Houdini in this book, Nothing so strange. When I read it, I was struck by its integrity. But as so often happens, denigrating reports said that Bess had already informed the Brooklyn Daily Eagle that any message from her husband would contain the word forgive. So whether this message involved genuine afterlife contact is unclear. In any case, it had not come from Houdini, but from Cecilia. Months later, however, in December 1928, as Bess lay ill with influenza, two messengers arrived from Arthur Ford, bringing another message, this time from Houdini himself. This photo is of Ford by Bess's bedside. He told her it had taken several months and seances to complete this message, which contained these ten words. Rosabel, answer, tell. Pray, answer, look, tell, answer, answer, tell. The name Rosabel in this list of words refers to the song that Bess sang the first time she shared the stage with Harry at Coney Island Amusement Park, the place where they fell in love. This name was carved inside Bess's wedding ring, and she sang the lyrics for Ford. Being convinced that this message was proof of genuine after-death contact, Bess issued an affidavit to that effect, resulting in sensational news coverage. But sceptics accused Ford of knowing the code that interprets this message, since it was published a year earlier in a book entitled Houdini, His Life Story by Harold Kellogg, 
based on the papers of Besudini. However, having examined page 105 of this book myself, and here is the key it published, I'd say there's no way that the brief information given by Kellogg is sufficient for Arthur Ford to have produced the message that he provided. When translated, the code became the phrase Rosabelle Believe. Despite Besser's positive affidavit, Ford was censured by his church. And later, in 1934, Bess issued a new statement withdrawing her affidavit and denying that she'd received the proof that she sought. This is her denial. Michael Roll, the author of the website The Campaign for Philosophical Freedom, asserts that Bess Houdini only retracted her affidavit in response to pressure from Roman Catholic priests. He says she was told that if she did not renounce her statement that she had received the message from her husband in its entirety and in the agreed-upon sequence, she would rot in hell forever. Well, I'm not able to confirm the truth of this claim, but because Harry was Jewish and Bess was not, when she died on the 11th of February 1943, aged 67, she was not interred alongside her husband. Her body went instead to the Roman Catholic Cemetery in Hawthorne, 25 miles north of New York City. By the way, Bess had offered a $10,000 reward for any medium providing the genuine proof that she had sought, but Ford neither claimed it nor received it. So is that the end of Houdini's quest to debunk all mediums while concurrently hoping for immortality for his own family? Well, the answer is no. For a decade after his death, Bess, who still employed a publicity agent, kept Houdini's name before the public by holding seances each Halloween for ten years, aiming to contact her husband. But in 1936 she gave up. There's a sound recording of the final seance that you can hear on YouTube. It was held in public on the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood. It's more like a publicity stunt than a real seance. It closes with Beth's remarking, I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. I've been studying afterlife evidence for around 20 years and had a memory of reading long ago of Houdini appearing at a seance to apologise publicly to Marjorie for the way that he treated her when both of them were alive. However, unable to trace a source for this old memory, I consulted Victor and Wendy Zamet, well known for their weekly afterlife evidence newsletter, and they sent me a transcript from a seance in 2007 with the physical medium David Thompson. Although Thompson's mediumship has been challenged by critics on numerous occasions, as indeed are all physical mediums, the Zamets worked closely with David for several years when he was in Australia, and they accept his phenomena as genuine. In this transcript, one sitter asks, I'd just like to ask you, Harry, and I'm not being flippant, have you made your peace with Marjorie Crandon yet? I've abbreviated Houdini's reply, and it says, Well, let me tell you that me and her brother, Walter Stinson, we had a few run-ins. Well, I suppose, because I'm dead, I had to accept it that I was dead. So let's just say that I buried a few hatchets. That might be the best way to tell you. And in response to the question to whom he'd done the greatest disservice when alive, Houdini replied, You want my truth? I'll give you some truth. Marjorie Crandon had the worst of my wrath. Marjorie Crandon. So in this transcript, Houdini did not offer much of an apology. As evidence that this really was Houdini talking, he promised to provide an apport that was personal, belonged to himself and could be verified by taking it to the Magic Circle in New York. But this has not happened, which provides grist to the sceptic's view. So is this the end of the story? Well, it is for now. Houdini, Bess and Marjorie may no longer be alive on Earth. But if you look on the internet, you'll find discussion about them remains as lively as ever, with Marjorie being portrayed mostly as a fraud. In my view, Houdini's campaign to discredit her 
did enormous and justified damage to her reputation, even taking into account that some of her phenomena were admittedly fraudulent. Thanks for listening.